Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. This is a, it's going to be an interesting piece here because I, I've sort of steered clear of sports the last 100 days, but somehow I woke up this week and Brandon Scott's going to be the next mayor and I'm not going to run a mayoral campaign uh, independently this summer against Sheila Dixon. So things have changed for me, maybe a little more beach time with my wife, but I'm starting to peel back a little bit and work my way backward into some guests that I've been wanting to have on for a period of time. Uh, This guy and I uh, have been knowing each other a long, long time since he was the first draft pick of the uh, Baltimore Ravens in their second season, a guy that Marvin Lewis drew up little PBs for Peter Bowler as a 4-3, as a 3-4 on the inside, on the outside, getting after the quarterback, and swore to me that somehow, some way, the Baltimore Ravens would draft Peter Bowler from Florida State, who came in here and was a hell of a football player, but even a better person, one of my Nasty Nice Guy Award winners back in 1999. We have maintained a very, very unlikely north-south relationship together even though I never really was a Florida State fan being a Maryland guy myself but Pete since we moved Maryland out to the Big Ten I can forgive and forget all things all those beatdowns in Tallahassee that we had um, and uh, you know I saw your piece on your wife's Facebook last week your, your wife and I are Facebook friends um, mm-hmm. on floridapolitics.com I know you ran for office and we've known each other a long time but I don't think you and I've ever talked politics in a public forum, but I uh, I appreciate you making your gestures forward to try to make the world a better place, and I just wanted to give you some oxygen for all the Ravens fans who loved you, and when Mike Flynn saw, uh, sent me that video from the 2001 parade, the most prominent jersey that pops out is this little boy in a purple 58 bowler jersey in the parade, <laughs> and I think that kid's like 33 now. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> How are you? Love you. Appreciate you. Miss you. How you been, man? Man, everything is really good down here. I mean, we've, you know, we're trying to get through COVID and we're trying to get through some things that we need to work through as a nation. But all in all, man, I'm just trying to have a positive ad- attitude and push forward. Man, I remember the night of the Nice Guy Awards. You acted like you'd never spoken in public before. My son and I were coaching you up and you know, giving you a back rub, trying to get you up in public speak. And then you go and run for public office. And, yep. I mean, you're one of those sort of quiet dudes. You never said a lot, really. But when you said something, it sort of mattered. And uh, I would not have voted. You thought that you were – I wouldn't have said a vote. I would have voted for you, Pete. But I wouldn't have said – Uh, that you were going to be a guy that would have run for elected office. Give me a little background on a guy from South Carolina, sort of where my mom's uh, area, where you grew up, and and going down to Florida State, coming up to Baltimore. Your career may have been a little shorter than maybe you wanted it to be. Um, You were certainly one of those guys in the Hall of Very Good that, you know, had you had five more good years, you could have been in the Hall of Fame. And I have other friends of mine like Chad uh, Chad Brown that I would say that about. They were just great football players. But then you sort of went on your own way 15 years ago or thereabouts. And Bring everybody up to speed on your life and your car dealership and everything, because I'm not sure everybody knows the Peter Bowler story. Yeah, when I um, when I got done with with the NFL, I had, had I was invested in this this car dealership, but um, you know when, when you retire from sports, you really just have to you've got to detox from the sport, and you've got to try to figure out you know what what. What am I going to do, you know, and how am I going to be significant and what am I going to do to try to really, you know, plug into the everyday uh, of society? And so I, I had retired uh, from football. Now, and is that weird? The, because you probably, from the neighborhood, you had enough money that you didn't have to work, right? Like, Yeah, it, yeah, but, but to be honest with you, it's, it's really not about the money. It's about having purpose. You know, that's sure. the tough thing about it. When you when you retire, you have the money. That you can only play golf or travel for so long. After but that, you get to you, pick you, what you do, and not everybody where you came from gets to pick what they do. They 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 do what is available for them to do, right? I mean, you had a different choice in yep. your life at thirty, right? Yeah, I did. I mean, and to a certain degree, you get to pick, but 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 sometimes too, you know, sometimes life picks it for you, and sometimes <laughs> certain c- circumstances and. And you may see a need in a city, and you're like, you know what, I may not want to do this, but uh, the city needs this. Or I may not want to fit this role in, in, in society, but there's a need there, and I can do it. And really, that was kind of my story running for public office. As you said before, I wasn't a guy that liked, liked to get out in front of speak to people. And you know, everybody I talked to you know, before about running for, for public office, they said, 
you're probably the most one most likely never to do it. And uh, well, I, I don't think you could talk about yourself enough to win, Pete. I mean, I I never knew you to talk about you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I just again, I was in it because I I saw a need. And I was asked to to help and get in. And again, I know all politicians say this, but I was I was just trying to serve and trying to help, you know. And so uh, I, I jumped into something. And again, it was it's about you know running for office is about public speaking. It's about raising money. It's about knocking on doors. It's about being out. And that was everything that wasn't me. And you know, so it was it was it was good for me because I learned a lot. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about the process. And uh, it was just, it, you know, it led me to the next phase of my life. And I got into private education after that. And uh, I did that for, you know, for, for 11 years, and I'm still involved in that as well. And so just my journey is just kind of, you know, taking me in, in different directions. Uh, I'm, I'm about to transition out of the, um, the school world. and I've jumped into the automotive industry. I've been invested in a Toyota store for 17 years, and I'm I'm working my way in to start uh, operating the store, and so that's been interesting as well. So, life has been good. It's been a, it's been a journey of, of twists and turns for me, but all in all, I can't complain one. But it's it's been a, it's been an incredible road for me. Well, I mean, you wrote this piece uh, out on in in Florida politics, and I'm going to refer everyone to FloridaPolitics.com. George Floyd mm-hmm. killing creates overdue ma- moment for change in America. Uh, demanding change and doing our small part. Run me through your experience as a kid from Columbia, South Carolina, finding your way to being a star, you know, and Bobby Bowden's team in a small town, in a college town, but also a political town, right? And, uh, yep. and obviously, when we talk about the Deep South, I mean, I don't know how many Confederate flags you've passed every day on your way to middle school, high school, college, wherever you are. I saw you ran as a Republican, I, you know, and also mm-hmm. were attached to Mike Huckabee in different ways and different people. Uh, Give me thoughts of what you've seen here the last 20 years and really, quite frankly, the last three and a half years with a Republican president in the South and doing what you do to be a part of doing good things here. Yeah, let me just say this. I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of good people on both sides of the aisle. Uh, again, I ran as a Republican, but I don't consider myself a partisan guy. You know, there's great Democratic ideas and they're great Republican ideas. Again, my fault is it's all about... Can we take the best ideas and can we move, uh, move the country forward in the right direction? And let me be honest with you. Um, when we talk about change and we, we talk about affecting society, I would say probably one of the worst vehicles to do that is, is the political sphere. Nothing ever really happens when it comes to that. There's a lot of arguing. There's a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of I don't like him. He doesn't like me. And it just th- things seem to get bogged down. The higher you go up in, in the government, the more everything just gets politicized. And just nothing much really gets done uh, in the political arena. You've got lobbyists and you've got every special, special interests. And to me, that seems to rule the day. And us regular people who are wanting change and wanting things to be better for ourselves and for our community and for, for other people, we don't get it because it's the special interest and it's the politicians who end up bogging things down. And I've learned for me at the end of the, of the day – if I want to affect change, if we want this country to go in the right direction, it's going to be the individual people. It's going to be you at your, your station. It's going to be me at this dealership. It's going to be that mob at home. We've got to take our sphere of influence wherever we are, and we've got to create the change, one person at a time. And so if we want this country to go in the right direction, don't count on your political figures. And I, I know you were thinking about running for office, but again, they will fail you every time. But if we take the ball and say, you know what, I'm just going to do my little piece in my little world. Maybe I may talk to one people. I may get to talk to 100 people. But if we all take that approach, that's how society changes. And so that's my, that's, that's my approach. Uh, that's my thought to the political figures. Are, I mean, are some of them good, and are they trying to do good? Yes. But, again, we fool ourselves if we think, okay, I'm electing these people. You guys make the world great for us, and we'll just sit back and watch it happen. It's not going to happen that way. We want to make it great. It starts with us. 
Peter Boulware has been my friend going on almost 25 years now, coming out of Florida State and jumping off that edge against the Buffalo Bills in that preseason game. Still remember it. Feels like it was yesterday uh, breaking out the 58 jerseys here. But, you know, I'm going to run you uh, – I'm going to make you a younger guy. I know you, your brother, Mike, we all want to be younger. Uh, I'll be 52 this year, which is a Ray Lewis number, which is a good, good number in Baltimore. But two and a half years ago, I'm over in Wembley. And, and Pete, let's say you're uh, – fourth year linebacker let's say let's take it back to 01 when you won the Super Bowl right right around that point in your career and you mm-hmm. and Ray Lewis or and uh, uh, Rob Burnett you're in a locker room in Wembley Stadium and you're coming out and the President of the United States has called you and everyone like you an SOB and and Colin Kaepernick's taking a knee and other guys are taking a knee and um, and, and knowing where you're from and what you're about. I was over in Wembley two and a half years ago. I saw some like a dozen of our guys take a knee. Uh, I was on their side. I took a knee. I put a picture up. I put it up 6 o'clock in the morning before they took a knee on the field. I lost sponsors. Hell rained down on me on the right side for the MAGA hats and all of that. Uh, and two and a half years later, all of a sudden, you know, Roger Goodell's taking a knee and Steve Bishotti's taking a knee and uh, all the people that called Kaepernick and SOB and blackballed him. I don't know where this is going to go, but I'm not going to repaint history. The history is what it is. I lived it. In Wembley, Colin Kaepernick's lived it. And now in the last couple of weeks since George Floyd, um, we've seen sort of a change of heart from some in the NFL. I don't know that we're all going to get there. I mean, Bill O'Brien said he's going to take a knee. Uh, I'll be talking to Marvin Lewis, Mike Tomlin, the friends that I have in the league about where they are. But run me through what you were thinking that day with Wembley and if you were a player and what – what pressures there would be on you on all sides of the political front, as well as from teammates, as well as watching a guy like Colin Kaepernick pretty openly get blackballed, right? Yeah, I mean, that, I hate to say it, but it's just it's an incredibly tough situation to be in. Again, I get what Colin Kaepernick was trying to do by taking a knee. I mean, he wants to take a stand for for injustice. And again, when I look at what he was trying to do, I think his heart was in the right place. Uh, do, do you have some other people that, that, that are very, you know, I don't, you call them patriotic or, or do they feel that taking a knee, uh, offends the flag or offends people that are, you know, supporting the flag? I mean, you, you have people, people that see it that way. And so it's, it's such a tough situation, uh, to be in. And again, for me, at the end of the day, it's, to me, it's all about your heart and what you're trying to do. You know, if you're taking a knee because you truly believe that you want to advance people and you want to help people and bring recognition to it, then that's your call. You know, but if you're standing up and saying, you know what, I want to honor my veterans. I want to honor this country. There's nothing against what Colin Kaepernick is doing, but I want to stand up and I want to honor this flag and honor this. That's my conviction. Then I say go with that. But I'm not going to be one of those guys that say, if you're kneeling, you're bad. If you're standing up, you're bad. You know what? You do what's in your heart, you know, and you do what's right. You do what you, you feel. I mean, you have different convictions, but again, the, the, the pointing p- fingers because that person is not like you or his conviction is not like yours, I think that's when we get into, in, into trouble. You know, again, I think, uh, I think a lot of these people out there that are trying, uh, they, they want to do good and they want to they wanna do what's right, what their, what their conviction is. Thank God we live in an incredible country that, that we do live in, that we all have the choice uh, to make the decision uh, that we do. And just because a guy doesn't make the decision that you, you, you agree with, all, all of a sudden they, can't, they, they, they don't have to be a bad person. You know, we just, you know, we've got to learn how to respect people's you know, opinions, but at the same time there are issues that we're having out here that need to be addressed. And, uh, and, and, and I tell you what, it, it's coming to head, uh, some of these, these, these issues that we've kind of kicked around and not, not addressed, and the country is, is tired, and the country is getting to a point where we've got to address some of these issues, especially when it comes to race. Well, you know, I remember the, the quote from Jesse Ventura back in the day. I actually had to look it up. Uh, he said, governments earn patriotism. Who mandated patriotism? You know, only the Germans in the 30s mandated patriotism. Um, and, and look, I talked to Nate Boyer, right, several times at the Super Bowl a couple of years ago uh, before the actual – uh, Trump incident, but after Kaepernick started kneeling, which was during the Obama administration, you remember. Um, and 
you know, he talked about kneeling being something you do before your creator almost unilaterally in every religion in the world. You bow or kneel before your creator as um, a, a, a show of your humanity, right? And so mm-hmm. the kneeling, it's... It, 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 it wasn't a fist to the sky. It wasn't a middle finger to the sky. It wasn't Stugatz or, you know, what you know some sort of international symbolism of hatred. Kneeling right. is an act of, of bowing, it, it, you know, I, uh, uh, giving of yourself, you know, making yourself available, humbling yourself, right? right. Um, and so that's why I thought it was just such a – you're taking a humbling act – and mm-hmm. equating it with patriotism, what's next? You're going to equate, equate patriotism with godliness? I mean, they do that right. in other countries too, right? But we don't do right. that here, you know. So, right, yeah, yeah. And, and, and again, to me, it's to me. I, I don't. I mean, I don't. The, the kneeling, whatever. To me, I want the message. What What are you trying to say? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to bring to light when when you do this? And the the issues that you're trying to bring to light are real issues. That we need to that we need to focus on. Again, everybody gets caught on the knee or down or up or whatever. Okay, but let's get past that. What are we trying to highlight, and what are you trying to do? At the very least, let's not miss that. You know, what I'm saying let's not miss 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 the the big picture. You know, and so to me, I'm like that's what we really really need to focus on. It's on it is is the big picture and and the broad stroke of what what what's trying to be accomplished there. What were you taught in South Carolina about Juneteenth and the Confederate flag and Fort Sumter? Yep. I, I, you know, I, I, I would love to hear this because, you know, my mom was born in 1919 in a little town mm-hmm. called Shoals Junction, South Carolina, uh, uh, west of Columbia, south of Greenwood and Greenville um, and, and Spartanburg in that area. And, you know, my mom grew up, uh, her, her grandfather was a Civil War hero. Um, to my knowledge, the 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 uh, the actual plaque and statue still exist in the square in Abbeville, South Carolina. He was a hero in that town. My my mom's grandfather, uh, Thompson was his last name, no P. And I've you know had pictures of the statue, and I remember seeing it when I was a little boy in the square there back in the 1970s. I mean, give everybody your background and growing up in South Carolina, because I don't know the whole story. Yep. I don't know that I ever asked you about it, Pete. You know, yep. sort of off limits to talk about like race in the South and the Confederate flag yep. for you and me back in '99. Not some Kevin Byrne would have wanted us talking about, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, let me just tell you this again. When I grew up in South Carolina, it was, you know, the race issue was a big deal there. And uh, let me just say this: the first, you know. Oh, no, the neighborhood that I grew up in, uh, and it, you know, my, my dad re- did well for himself, but the neighborhood that I grew up in, had a, it had a, a golf course in there, and it had a golf club in there. And uh, if you were black and you moved in that neighborhood, you were not allowed on the golf course, and you were not allowed into the golf club. And that's just the way it was. I mean, it was. This it was is nineteen ninety. What? Uh-uh. No, this is eighty. This is early eighties. Okay. You know, it, it sounds weird, but it, that's just the way it was. And my friends would have parties there or whatever, and I knew I just I can't go there or I can't go on those golf courses. And so we were. It was really. It was. It was backwoods. But again, as 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 black people, we just we just accepted it. That's just kind of the the way it was. You know, in our state, they they flew a Confederate flag. And for the longest time, that was just that was just the state flag, and that's just the way it was. And we, you know, we just kind of accepted it. You know, we we found a way to 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 take things that were wrong and backwards, and we were just kind of like, you know what? We just have to try our best to, to work around it. And we we had to try to find our way and when there was injustice or whatever to say, you know what? It's just this is just the way things are, and hopefully it will get better. And, uh, and that's kind of how we lived. And as, as, as things progressed, you know, you know, 15, 20, I don't know when that, when that flag was taken down from the Capitol, it finally was taken down, you know, and, and again, things started, uh, t- to get better. But again, there's just, you know, it was, it, it was a backwards time back in, in, in the South and, and in South Carolina. And, uh, we've, we we've come a little way, but in a lot of ways we still have so so far to go. And there's there's so many people that that don't understand black people, and black people don't understand white people, and there's just so many barriers there that we've got to we've got to push push pause as, as a country and say you know what, let's quit pushing these things to a side. Let's talk with about them. 
and let's deal with it. And when there's, where, where there's injustice, where there's things that, that aren't right, let's apologize, but that, let's come up with a practical plan to move forward. And until we do that, until we, you know, really have real conversations and talk through this thing, we will always have issues. But if we can, if we can just kind of slow down and start talking through these things and bring these issues to light, we can move forward as a country. And, and again, I'm hoping with all that's going on with the country right now, I'm hoping that, that everyone will start taking stock and say, you know what, we're going to deal with this. We're going to get past this thing. And it may take some, a while, it may take some tears, and it may take some things that we've got to get through, but we're going to push through this, and we're going to be a better country for, for it. And that's my hope, and that's my goal right now. Peter Boulware is our guest. He was uh, once a Baltimore Raven in 1997 draft and uh, ran for a, as a Republican for Florida House of Representatives uh, 12 years ago. Feels like 12 lifetimes ago that uh, you ran around and played football. <laughs> Pete's now 45 and uh, working with the uh, the folks at Legacy Toyota as vice president there, uh, taking over the dealership down in Tallahassee. And uh, Pete, uh, talk about driving around uh, Columbia, South Carolina or Tallahassee, uh, maybe as a famous football player or just a kid or uh, just as an African-American who's kind of a, uh, you were a bigger guy. You've, you, you're you normal size now, but you were bigger when you are a football player. Um, you're one of the guys that's been, a, that's slimmed down and never lost it 15 years later. Um, but getting pulled over by a police officer, you know, I've I've been pulled over a couple times. I never really thought it was going to uh, be anything tragic or weird. I've had a tail light out and a rolling stop at a stop sign and, uh, you know, five miles over the speed limit and get a warning, whatever. I've had all that happen in my marriage, you know. Um, mm-hmm. but, but I, I, don't ever think about it like that, but now I'm thinking when the police officer pulls me over, where are my hands? Are they on the steering wheel? What is the protocol of getting pulled over? I think it's a whole different deal when uh, it looks like you and doesn't look like me. It is. It, it's unfortunate. Now, let me just say this for me, um, and I haven't gotten pulled over in, in a very, very long time, and so I haven't had to deal with it that much, but again, it's something that I've got two boys. It's unfortunate, but I have to teach them. Look, your skin color is a little different, and uh, the standard may be a little different from you, and uh, you have to be careful. You have to do things incredibly right. Your hands have to be right. Your voice and your tone have to be, you know, you have to go over the top because, again, there is a risk and there's a chance for you that you may not get treated the way you're supposed to be treated. And uh, it's just a- a- as a black person in-, in today's society, that's what you have to deal with. And, uh, again, that's, the thank God I've never had the, the abuse in, in that way. But for so many black people, though, that's, that's what they have to go through. And that's the, the, the conversations that they have to have uh, with their kids. Because, again, the, the reality is, you know, who knows what's going to happen. But those are conversations that, that we have to have. Wish we didn't have to. I wish we were past that. But we are not. And uh, we've got we've to do better as a country. Pete, if you're a junior and Bobby Bowden wants you to come play football down in Tallahassee during a pandemic and your family's in Columbia and you've been locked down with a mask on and trapped in your place, uh, or if you're, Marvin Lewis is calling you and Art and Brian Billick are calling you and say, get back here, we've got to go win a Super Bowl here. Uh, you come on back in, wear a mask, we'll check you in, stay away from your family, don't touch the gas pumps, wear gloves, all that. We're in a weird spot here the next seven or eight weeks. I mean, Everybody keeps telling me you're going to play football uh, of all kinds, right? We're going to send kids back yeah. to school, and we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do the other. Uh, and, and the COVID numbers are up everywhere, uh, especially in the places where they didn't take it as seriously as probably they should. And, you know, my wife's a two-time cancer survivor. She's a diabetic, so she can't be exposed to COVID for me. Um, I think every American, every human being here is going to have some choices to be made, including the sports themselves and how they're going to keep football players safe and in locker rooms and one guy spikes a positive, they're gonna, the whole team's going to have to shut down and not play the Lions this week or whatever. I don't know how this is going to get managed, but this is going to be quite a tightrope, I think, for all of society, whether it's the baseball players trying to figure their money out, whether it's the NBA players trying to all get together in one place and do this. But for sports, and you know all I've ever done is sports, man. I mean, you know, 35 mm-hmm. years has been my living. I never thought we'd shut sports down for 100 days, but here we are. And then the question is, how do we open it back up and what's realistic here? 
Uh, yeah, some of this sounds very Willy Wonka to me to think that we're going to put yep. 32 football teams together and play yep. football games in empty stadiums. It's going to work out. I, I, yep. I, I don't see it as that easy, man. It, it's not that easy. And again, I, just, I hate to say it this way, but it's all driven by the dollar. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it's a billion dollar industry. And so the dollars are too important to people. Uh, it's too much uh, money for the economies. And, uh, and so be, be, because of the dollar and because of the, the amount of income that, that, uh, that's out there that could be lost for, for not playing it, it's going to be played. And they're going to, you know, they're, you know, they're not going to say this, but health and uh, the, the safety of the players, that's probably second, secondary uh, to, to the dollars that, that have to be generated by sports. And so, I mean, how they're going to figure it out and how they're going to keep players safe, I have no idea. I mean, football to me is the if, – if I look up a, de- a definition of the exact opposite of social distancing, it is football. I mean, it, it's, it's sweat, it's rapping, it's, it's blood. I mean, it's just – you know, that's just, that's just the way it is. And so it's going to be – you know, it's going to be tough to, to, to keep people from spreading, spreading a virus around in that environment. Uh, but uh, they're going to give it a shot, you know. And, again, there's so many dollars on the line, it's just – it's it's hard to, to to cancel a an NFL season or a college football season. I know I live here in Tallahassee, and and this this town, I mean, it rises and falls off of, off of, off of football and the, the hotels, the restaurants, uh, the the economy, the school depends on those dollars. And uh, if you cancel the season and don't have the dollars, it will be a it would it would have a devastating effect uh, on 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 this town and, and the university. So. Uh, it's it's going to be done, and uh, hopefully, hopefully they'll find a way to 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 make sure they can they can keep the, the cases down a little bit. We'll see how it goes. Well, I got to give some love to our friends at Toyota because uh, Jay Pivik and uh, Pivnet and all of our friends in the buyatoyota.com audio vault going on almost twenty years now. Toyota's been very good to me. I know uh, you've mm-hmm. gotten involved in the Toyota family. And I, I just wanted to give a shout out as well, not just your Florida politics piece on George Floyd, but I, I went back a couple weeks ago and saw the Tallahassee Democrat wrote a piece about. You over at Legacy Toyota putting together masks, you know, in the yep. beginning of COVID, trying to keep people safe. And, yep. you know, we're all trying to be sensible, Pete. And, and you know, for, for, for all of this, keeping people alive. And I know in every community, especially in our seniors, we've just been ravaged, you know, and, and, and keeping people safe. And, and you being, you know, elbow to elbow with customers on a daily basis at your Toyota dealership. Yeah, yeah, it's tough. I mean, trying to trying to keep our doors open and trying to ser- serve customers, but at the same time trying to stay safe. So wearing masks, wearing gloves, trying to social distance. That's been that's kind of what we're doing. But again, I mean, we're all in this together. I mean, we all got to get through it. And so uh, we just we we've got to be smart and we've got to help people. Some people are in tougher situations than us, and that's where we as community leaders we we help people out. And so this is a worldwide problem. This is not just a problem to, with Legacy Toyota or you. It's a problem with everybody. But again, we're we're America. We're we're strong. I mean, we we've, we've got a backbone. We're we're re- resilient, and we're gonna we're gonna find a way to bounce through this thing. And uh, hopefully, we'll we'll be better when we come out on on the other side. Now, I was gonna ask you: Is it tougher sacking quarterbacks or selling Toyotas? And I'm thinking, well, you you only had 70 sacks. Have you sold a lot more cars? So. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. sacks must yeah, be harder. I'll tell you what, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, I mean, I tell you what, I mean, it, 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 it's tough sometimes getting in here and convincing people, you know. But uh, <laughs> Toyota, I tell you what, they sell themselves, man. They're, they're great products. I mean, they do a good job with it, and they've got a good brand behind it. So I'm just glad to be a part of it and got, glad to to be associated with it. So it's been. It's been a really, really good transition for me. Our friends at Cherry sold my wife a Camry, and we're driving said Camry to the uh, beach this weekend to socially distance, where I'll be thinking of you and Kenzie and your family and how beautiful you looked last year and coming together. Look, man, we sat here and talk politics. We talk race. We talk uh, you know, sports. We talk. Give me your, your thoughts 20 years later about the Super Bowl thing, because I'm going to blow your mind, brother. Um, Mike Flynn mm. invited me into the the parade that day in 01, and I told this story a couple weeks ago. I think Flynn was the last guest I had on, like, the day before COVID, and you know his boys on Broadway, right? He was the lead in mm. Mrs. Doubtfire up in New York on Broadway, and, and the show got closed down two days into COVID, you know? So uh. Flynn and I rode on the the 
parade route in 01. Do you remember what David Modell's gift to all of you was, those video cameras that everybody had? Yeah, down in Tampa. I do. I remember that. Yep. So everybody had the little video cameras, if you remember, little handhelds. And I went down that morning, and I caught a cold in Tampa, Pete. I mean, I got sick Super Bowl week, and I flew back to Philadelphia because I was nationally syndicated. We had a big party at the barn. And I went down to the parking lot that day only to get a guest. So Molotalo promised me if you won the Super Bowl, he was going to come out and fire dance. So I was sure I had Ed, but I needed to go down there and wrangle him because things were crazy, and Dilfer was at Disney World. You know, stuff was going on. It was all 48 hours after you won the Super Bowl, right? Mm-hmm. We'd been up all night at the Hyatt down there. I have pictures of you and me that night. So we get back, and Flint says, get on my float and, and videotape me, you know, going through the parade. And I'm like, well, I mean, I, didn't, I wasn't dressed for it. I didn't even bring a jacket, you know. It was cold and rainy, as you remember. So I held that video camera for an hour. Pete, we laughed. We cried. You know it was the most amazing thing ever, riding in that parade. Mm-hmm. And then two months later, I'm with Flynn, and I'm with Kyle Richardson, in, in spring training, March or April, down in Florida. Flynn's got a place down there in Fort Lauderdale. The Orioles are training down there. And I saw the tape in Flynn's apartment, and I said to him, dude, let me take that tape. I'll mix it down. I'll get a duplicated tape, and I'll give you copies of it. No, 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 no. Dude, dude, dude. I'll, 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 take, care, I'll take care of it. I'll take care of it. That was March of 2001. <laughs> Peter, he's my best friend on the team. Like, he and I still get together together. Often, you know, we get together as often as we can. Maybe once or twice mm-hmm. a year, we go to concerts, we get crabs together. We're friends, you know, 20 years later. He lost the tape oh boy. in 2001. And since about six or seven or eight, I've just been destroying him, right? Like, dude, you lost the videotape of us in the Super Bowl parade. You should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> he finally, because of COVID, found it. And he sent it to me, and I released it, and your wife went nuts wanting a copy of the whole thing. I've only released a minute and four seconds of it, right? But I have an hour that. Give me, like, where you are from all that that means to you. Not just owning Legacy Toyota or what it means to be a Florida State guy or an NFL alum, but to be a champion and... The whole Raven thing, because you come back, you're humble, dude. You come back every five years, your kids are five years older, you're five years skinnier and better looking and healthier (laughs) and all that. But, I mean, 20 years later, what is it all worth? What does it mean? Uh, I tell you what, it it means more 20 years later than it did when we we won it. You know, and and the longer you go and the the longer you've been out the game, you, you appreciate it. And you appreciate the memories. Uh, you you appreciate the guys, you appreciate the journey, and you really realize how hard it was to get there and to win it. And uh, I just I, I'm so thankful that I had the opportunity uh, to be a part of that world championship team, to be a part of that uh, the city. Uh, it's just it's just a special time, and um, I you know I just I'm so, I'm so thankful. Uh, there's a lot of people that that play the game that don't have that opportunity. And uh, we did, and we 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 notched our 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 our, our mark in, in history, and uh, it, it's something that I'll never forget. Uh, I'll tell my kids about it, and hopefully they'll tell tell their grandkids about it. But it's just it's one of those things in life that that, that you most people don't get. Uh, but if you get it, it's wonderful. And uh, as the years go, it just gets sweeter and sweeter thinking about it. So, cool time in my life. Well, I'll tell you what, every time you see an Ed Reed or a Ray Lewis or a John Ogden or Dion or all these guys you played with, you know, uh, yeah, and, yeah. and it pops up every year. I, I don't see you enough. I don't get to Tallahassee often enough to come down there and eat some Apalachicola <laughs> oysters with you or, you know, roll down to Destin or, or Panama City yeah. or whatnot. But when, you know it. <laughs> when I do, I will be honking a horn at Legacy Toyota and stopping and seeing you. And, and I know the Ravens will bring you back on the other side of all of this mayhem and craziness and hopefully be have a, uh, a better city and a better society and a, a stronger country and hopefully we get through this area and, and I can do what I love to do give you a big hug Pete how about that all right I hear you man hey well you keep doing your thing up there man uh I miss I miss hanging out with you guys up there man but but keep doing it keep doing good for that city up there man you just you're uh, you're you're a great part of of, of what Baltimore is all about I appreciate you, Pete. You're a great part of what the football's all about and picking up all the – people ask me, say, what do you do? I said, I collect people. You know what I mean? And I've collected yeah. them all over the place. So uh, love to you guys down in Tallahassee. We'll see you soon. All right? 
All right. Good talking to you, man. We'll see you around. Peter Bolware, former uh, first-round draft pick of the Baltimore Ravens, fourth overall out of, dare I say, the Seminole Nation, Florida State, Tallahassee. Checking in. You can go read his piece at it, floridapolitics.com. Floridapolitics.com. The headline is, George Floyd killing creates overdue moment for change in America. We must demand change and do our small part to make it happen. Peter Bolware, number 58 in your program, number one in your heart. Unless you went to Maryland. Probably didn't like him very much when he came in here. 94, 95, 96, 97. We are WNST.net, AM 1570. We are calm. We are local. Email me anytime. Find me out on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Snapchat, Instagram. And always Baltimore Positive.